Welcome to the Verda Verdict Sports Show. I'm your host, Jacob Verda, and welcome into our weekly episode where we're breaking down LSU's game this week. We also have a big recruiting update for you, plus we'll recap some interviews we did with guys like Malik Neighbors, Will Campbell, and Brian Kelly. So make sure to subscribe, comment your takes throughout the episode. Without further ado, let's dive right into one of the hottest topics regarding LSU football as of late. Jaden Daniels, uh, the quarterback performance has been phenomenal lately honestly it's probably one of the best performances out of any quarterback out of any team in the entirety of college football if you look at the Heisman tracker as we'll call it Jane Daniels exceeded 400 total yards in four games this season which tied Joe Burrow's 2019 record he's the first player in LSU history with 5,000 passing yards and 1,000 rushing yards here in Baton Rouge and he's also one of six players in the entire FBS history with 10,000 passing yards and 2,000 rushing yards. So he's a real get-it-done-on-the-ground type of quarterback. If he can't get it through the air, he can definitely extend the play, get outside, avoid that containment by the defense, and just make a coordinator's life a living hell. Jaden Daniels has been super creative, and Mike Dembrock has paired him with extreme talent and guys like Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas Jr., and they've really been able to make that offense explode over the last couple of weeks. If we track the Heisman favorites, currently you see guys like Michael Penix Jr. sitting atop the standings. Currently, favored negative 130 out of Washington. Then you got guys like J.J. McCarthy, Dylan Gabriel, Jordan Travis, and of course LSU's Jaden Daniels. Now look, a couple weeks ago Jaden was about plus 2,500. So you can see here now, about two weeks removed from that, he's already cut his odds in half. So that Heisman, you know, the Heisman talk has really been picking up for number five. And rightfully so. If you look at the offensive stats, LSU's one of two teams in the top 10 in both rushing and passing. The only other team that is completing these type of statistics is Oregon. And, you know, Bo Nix has earned a little bit of TV time in that Heisman category as well. So I think it's only right Jaden Daniels is getting his fair share of glory. LSU's leading in seven categories in the top 10 offensive statistics, as we said, passing and rushing. Then you got the first downs where they're number two, total offense where they're number two as well, third down conversions. Once again, number two, scoring, number three, and pass efficiency, number four. So this is not just, you know, an explosive offense that's getting it done over the last couple of weeks. No, this is somebody that you could put toe-to-toe with any scoring offense, whether it be a Washington, an Oregon, a USC, or what have you. I think that LSU's putting it out pretty high pace. And, you know, when you see things like Jaden Daniels breaking 2019 records or Jaden Daniels in the same breath as Joe Burrow, yeah, you get kind of a mixed reaction. You get half of the LSU fans upset that you're even talking about Jaden Daniels and Joe Burrow in the same sentence, and then you get the other half that are confused on how this is even happening. You know, the 2019 year, of course, it's an undefeated season. It ends in a national championship. It's it's a dream. Like, the LSU fans had to pinch themselves the entire year. However, when you look at these statistics, it's pretty interesting to see that that offense is very, very eerily similar. If you look at the points per game, 2019, LSU was scoring 48 points. Right now, they're scoring 45. The pass yards, 2019, of course, they had a little bit more, 401 per uh, game. Then you got LSU currently in 23, averaging 335 yards per game. But here's where things shake up. Rushing yards per game in 2019, LSU was averaging 166 per game. Currently, they're averaging over 200 at 214 yards per game. Now, this isn't saying that LSU is 100% better run team than they were in 2019, but what what it does show is that there's a completely new wrinkle in this offense that there wasn't back in 2019. Now, sure, the team is completely different. If you wanted to look at defensive statistics, yeah, that could be, you know, that's night and day, complete opposite. But the offensive side of things, you know, like Coach Kelly said, you definitely shouldn't take it for granted. It's remarkable stuff. And I think that, you know, years removed, we're going to be looking back on guys like Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, Mason Taylor, and be like, man, you remember those days? Th- these are definitely going to be LSU legends here down the road. <clears throat> now, you know, we're starting it off positive. We're starting it off nice and, you know, all, everything's going well. But something that kind of throws a wrench in these things for teams usually are injuries. And it's not always great to talk about them, but we got some updates in this category, some injury news. First things first, Chris Hilton, probable to return for Saturday. He's one of our faster wide receivers, a big depth boost. I mean, anytime you could add another dangerous player at a skill position, I say go ahead and do it. More depth, you know, the more the merrier always in football. But I think 
you know, we, we, we've got a couple of spots where LSU's holding their breath, where LSU fans are a little bit nervous, especially after the Auburn game when you see someone like Emory Jones Jr. go down. You see Emory go down, and not only that, goes in the tent, but comes out without the shoe on, goes straight to the locker room, comes back out in street clothes, and uh, it made a lot of people worry. And not only is it an offensive lineman, but it's a staple of the offensive line. I mean, Emory Jones has been, since his freshman year, probably one of the most dependable offensive tackles in college football. So the fact that he's going down definitely made a lot of people worry, but Worry no longer. Brian Kelly gives us an update, says he should be back a lot quicker than expected. It's only a sprained ankle. The plan currently is he may rest against uh, Saturday as he's doubtful, and then we get the bye week right after, and then you lead into the Alabama game. Now, here's a little bit of a curveball. I mean, everybody saw that happen on Saturday, but there's something going on, you know, a little bit behind the scenes that people didn't really get to see and that Coach Kelly gave us an update on. Makai Wingo has been nursing a lower body injury for a little bit. Uh, he said for most of the season, man, you know, this two-week span, much like Emory Jones Jr., is going to be a chance to get him right, chance to get him healthy, get that physicality back. And this isn't going to be something that you can use as uh, a crutch or kind of an excuse as an LSU fan to be like, well, this is why the defense is performing horribly. No, that's not why. But this does kind of show that not everything – is how it seems in terms of football. Not every It's always more than meets the eye is what I'm getting at. If you see LSU struggling against the run or, you know, LSU's not able to get the stops they need in Ole Miss or Mizzou stays in a little bit longer than people expected, it could be for things like this. You don't really hear about a Makai Wingo getting hurt throughout the last couple of weeks. He's just playing through it. That's the number 18 mentality. Going on the field, giving all you got. But, you know, sometimes the uh, – Players got to be stopped from themselves. The players got to be, you know, put in a situation to rest and get better and hopefully turn the tide and keep pushing the momentum for this LSU defense. You know, the Army game, though, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and write Army off like the sports book or if you want to look. Spreads at negative 31. Totals at only 58, but LSU is a negative 10,000 favorite. That's right, negative 10,000 according to Las Vegas. I mean... Based off of how heavily uh, heavily favored LSU is, as much or as easy as it would be to peek towards a bye week or peek towards Alabama, I would 100% urge LSU not to do it. Why? It's a run-heavy team. When you're playing defense against a run-heavy team, they're going to try to wear you down. They're going to try to chew that clock. They're going to try to make it very, very difficult for your offense to just explode and have enough time to be able to utilize. So if you want to look at the run stats for LSU versus Army to just kind of get a, a feel for what they're doing, uh, our rush yards on the year are 1,500. Army's at about 1,200. Our yard per carry is at 5.7. Army's is right around 4. And touchdowns, LSU is 18. Army has 11. So they're not going to be one of the more elite run games we face. They're not going to be, you know, an SEC-level run game like an Ole Miss. They're not going to pound the defensive line all night and go for 300 yards on us, hopefully. But what's going to happen here is you get a lot of good reps. And the way I'm looking at this game is every rep counts. You know, when you got young talent getting on the field, hell, when you got some of our defensive units getting on the field that have an experience, that have to gel into these new roles, and not only into the new roles, but gel into a new team. Some players haven't played alongside each other for longer than three, four weeks. So let's get these guys together. Let's get that gelled up. And let's continue, you know, to add on to the momentum and keep pushing this down the road. <clears throat> I think something that's going to help LSU in this, and I mean this goes without saying, but it's going to be an offensive showcase because Army's secondary is toast. To summarize them. Currently, LSU's on a six-game streak of having a 100-yard receiver. Last week, Kyron Lacey continued the streak versus Auburn. But if you look at the receiving room, it's leader after leader. You got Brian Thomas leading the nation in, uh, with nine receiving touchdowns. You got Malik Neighbors leading the nation in receiving yards. And combined, the duo has the most touchdowns in the SEC. So Jaden Daniels has a plethora of weapons. I mean, he's a weapon in and of itself. He can get in the end zone any given point, break away for a 50-yard run in any given point. But when you got two guys on either side of the ball and you can mix in Kyron Lacey as of last week getting over 100 yards, this is an unstoppable offense. You got so many running backs, you got so much talent up front on that line, and you got so many receivers that you can put out deep with a quarterback who's just as about as accurate as anybody. I think that this team could easily score another 50, 50 plus points, 40 plus points. They could definitely go out there and put on a clinic. 
the thing is that the defense is going to have to utilize this and just not get caught sleeping. I think the keys for this game, number one, start fast on both sides of the ball. Don't just start fast on offense. Don't just start fast on defense. Let's get a good, efficient, intense performance from both sides of the ball from start to finish. Keep your head in the game. I wouldn't look ahead like we said. We talked to Will Campbell, and he left us with something pretty interesting, I found. He said, Coach Davis always reminds the squad that they're one weekend away from embarrassment. And boy, is that true in college football. You could be looking ahead. You could be caught doing whatever. But if you're not sitting in the moment, if you're not, you know, smelling the roses of what's going on right now in this current week, that's when the problems start. That's when the mistakes happen. That's when the upsets or the, you know, the trap games come to bite you. So I believe Will Campbell's right by saying that these guys, they, they need to hem in right here and just realize that. Second key, the reps matter. Every game builds experience. A lot of people can benefit from this practice in an unpressured environment. You know, it's live reps. There's the beauty of that. It's another team you can let loose. You know, you can get those reps in. You got young talent like guys like Caleb Jackson, Shelton Sampson. Even Garrett Nussmeyer and Ricky Collins are probably going to see the field. So you're going to see a new era of LSU football on that field. I think every game that they can get in and, you know, get some, get some reps is going to be something that's going to benefit them for sure. Lastly... This is an opportunity to do some lineup tweaks. Uh, I, I would use this as a chance to find the unit that works, keep putting that momentum, like we said earlier, together, and just have all these guys on the same page. Because it, it, it's evident that, you know, at times in the beginning of the year, they were getting accustomed to their new roles. And at times, either some people's roles might have been too big, too confusing, not communicated properly. But either way, they're figuring out, you know, the uh, they're figuring out the highs and lows, that's for sure. So they're, I think... In a pretty good situation to probably score six to seven touchdowns here this weekend. My score prediction would be LSU 49, Army 10. Definitely going to cover that 30 spread that Vegas has. You know, it's a pretty steep spread, but when you see them covering it last week against an SEC opponent, it's kind of hard not to ride the hot hand. I feel like that's the theme here this uh, year with LSU football. Riding the hot hands, riding the trends, and that's what I'm going to do here uh, 100%. Moving on to... The recruiting update, number six class per on three, updated apparently this past week with several new commitments, a couple D commitments, a couple people getting a little bit uh a little bit unnerved with the D commitments, a couple people getting nervous with how the recruiting cycle is going. But I mean that's recruiting. You win some, you lose some. This is flipness as they call it. You see some kids go, you see some kids show up. The commits we got this week, Edge, C.J. Jackson, sent Twitter in a frenzy. Everybody was excited over that one. Wide receiver Terrence Francis also commits. But then you get two D commits. You get DB Andre Evans to Georgia and wide receiver Joseph Stone decommits from LSU. And uh, I think, you know, that these type of moments are expected. You expect the D commitments, but the fact that they're getting the commitments, the fact that they're pulling kids into Tiger Stadium on an electric night, I feel like LSU's got... You know, they, they got leverage in this recruiting world. And they might not necessarily have all the NIL money and be able to just boost up their transfer portal class like some colleges. But in the era of recruiting, when you're trying to give a kid an experience and you're trying to showcase what your university can do and how life is like it and how you can grow your brand, I feel like LSU is one of the best examples in the country. But moving on to the Auburn game, we're going to do a little brief recap of that. Don't want to lose you, so I'm going to keep it really, really brief. Uh, Big-time game for the defense. Put pressure on Peyton Thorne. Limited him to about 102 passing yards, 52% accuracy. Offense kept rolling, though. Jaden Daniels stats 20 for 27, 74% pass accuracy, 325 pass yards, 93 rush yards, three pass touchdowns. Malik Neighbors went off for 89 yards and a touchdown. Kyron Lacey, of course, as we said, broke that century mark, 111 yards. And a touchdown, and LSU covered the spread by a mile. It opened that negative 11 and a half, closed that negative 29 and a half. Tigers showed up. The real Tigers showed up. LSU Tigers, that is. Top three games of the week, though. We're going to break down what we think the top contests are, how they're going to fare, how they're going to shake up, who would you pick, well, all that good stuff. Penn State, Ohio State, we're going to start things off. Who's going to wrap the Big Ten East? This is one of those battles where you can kind of see that division shaping up. Of course, everybody wants to see the end-all, be-all, the game between Ohio State and Michigan. That's normally going to be what determines who's going to the conference championship from this side. But this Saturday, we get kind of a brief little matchup to see who's going to take that one or two spot. 
uh, Penn State versus Ohio State, number seven versus number three, the only top ten match of uh, this weekend. James Franklin, head coach for the Nittany Lions, is one and eight versus the Buckeyes. And I think that Ohio State has a lot of firepower, too. So this is not a good matchup for Penn State. You're going into a situation where, you know, you feel like you don't have the upper hand. And on this, on the paper, you don't have the upper hand. They have a lot more talent. Plus, it's in Columbus. They have a home field advantage. They're able to be in their, you know, daily routine, keeping things the way they want to keep them. I think that that says a lot here. And I think another thing I kind of want to mention is uh, I feel like You'd be insane to think that Penn State's going to go in and just change the tune-up. Now, look, we have been wrong here in this segment in the past, so it could definitely happen. And out of any of these three games, I could see this one being the one that could be the most volatile. But definition of insanity is thinking that something's going to give a different result than it once has over and over and over given. And I believe that Penn State losing eight out of the last nine against Ohio State under James Franklin, that shows me all I need to see. I think Ohio State's going to take this one. Could be a close game. Could be a shootout. And we could definitely be upset here. But that's who I'm sticking with. Moving on to Alabama versus Tennessee. Now, th- this is where it gets interesting. I think this is every SEC fan's best game this this week. You get to see one of the more interesting rematches that Alabama's going to have this season. Of course, you got to see them play Texas. And then you're going to have to see them play LSU here in about two short weeks. But Tennessee going back to Tuscaloosa, they had a close game, Bama, against Arkansas, and that kind of gave you some hope as an LSU fan. You see Alabama kind of take the Arkansas game away. They kind of ran away with it in the first half, and then it gets close, back and forth. There's some interesting performances by Jalen Murrow here and there, and now you're thinking Alabama isn't, I'm not going to say isn't as good as you once thought, but now you think that there's a potential, a little bit of competition between LSU and Alabama. Now we can make some things interesting. You know, going after week one when LSU loses to Florida State, the amount of uh, morale that LSU fans had for that LSU-Alabama contest, it's a lot better here now after the Auburn game. Now, why is that? It's because our offense is on fire. It's because Alabama's defense is kind of rocky and their offense is starting off a little bit rocky. But in this Tennessee game, I don't think any of that's going to be a problem. I think, you know, Tennessee's not as strong as they were last year. This isn't going to be that high... You know, what was it, almost over 100 total points in that matchup. I think their running game is great. Tennessee has a great running game, but they lost to Florida on the road. They're on the road again. This is obviously a problem for them. I'm not saying they're guaranteed a loss here, but more than likely Alabama's going to get that edge if you had to make me pick between the two. I think that Nick Saban's definitely going to want to avenge that loss from last year, but as an LSU fan, you're going to get to see a brief preview of what that LSU-Alabama game's going to be like it's almost the same storyline LSU beats Alabama in Tiger Stadium last season Tennessee beats Alabama in Nayland Stadium last season now you move on this year Nick Saban's trying to right his wrongs from last year and I think if Alabama walks the Tennessee Volunteers LSU is going to be uh a lot more hesitant to play Alabama they're going to uh, the fans are going to be a lot more worried I think that this game really kind of controls that momentum and the morale around that contest between the Tigers and the Crimson Tide. Moving on to Utah and USC. This is another interesting game. We want to talk about uh, avenging a loss. This is a Pac-12 Conference Championship rematch right here. And then it couldn't come at a worse time for USC because they're on the heels of a horrific loss to Notre Dame. I mean, Caleb Williams with three interceptions in the first half. Is he playing with a blindfold out there? Not only did he throw three picks, but he threw away the Pac-12 title last year to Utah as well. Utah has clamps. Their defense is lights out. I think that, you know, they proved last year that they're not going to back down from a tough test and that they're going to push offenses to the very final snap. You saw him throw that interception at the end of this uh, conference championship last season. And I'm really interested to see if Caleb can have back-to-back bad weeks because if he does, you can cross his name off the Heisman Trophy right now. He's not going to get it again. Um, But... If Utah can get back-to-back wins against USC, I think that that would make a pretty interesting little end to this Pac-12 rivalry that they've had. It would be a pretty horrible time for USC. They'd they'd be really glad to get out of that conference because it's going to leave a bad taste in their mouth. But with that being said, we got to make the pick. And I know I'm sitting here harping on USC and Caleb Williams doing bad, but I mean, I just don't see two bad back-to-back performances. When you're the potential number one draft pick and you got all this pressure on your shoulders, yeah, it's kind of rough, but I think that pressure turns a lot of great athletes into 
you know, in a diamond, so to speak. I think that he's going to be able to perform well, or he's going to be able to use last week as kind of a chip on the shoulder type crutch, and I think that he could push through, get some action against Utah. You know, they're not 100%. They're not going to be able to just put all their best guys out there like USC will. But USC does have a huge confidence killer as of last week. So there is that left in there. You know, they can take that and go one of two ways. They can either build off of it or continually collapse from it. So I'm going to I'm gonna lean and air on the side of caution. I'll take USC here in this one, even though they're the lower ranked team. And even though a lot of the public might be fading them, I'm going to ignore the noise. I'm going to say Ohio State, Alabama, USC, and of course LSU. If you're not... Thinking LSU's winning this one this Saturday. I got another thing coming for you. I mean, in Vegas, to get $100 from a sports book, you got to put down $10,000. That's how much of a lock that is this weekend. Yeah, we'll see them run the football. Yeah, we'll see some good end zones. I mean, that's a nice little paint, nice little change up here in Tiger Stadium. We're going to see some cadets. We're going we're gonna to pay tribute to the United States of America, but I think LSU's going to get that dub. You know what Will Campbell said? Yeah, we respect them. And it's going to be great to see. It's going to be really awesome. But when the lights turn on on Saturday night, it's another football game. And I think it's a football game that LSU is going to have a lot a lot of success. And I think that offense is going to be able to explode as they have been in the last couple of weeks. Jaden Daniels is going to keep adding on to that impressive streak, keep adding on to a string of impressive performances, and inevitably keep cutting down that Heisman odds. I mean, well, we started at plus 2,500. I'm sure that he'll be a finalist by the end of the year. And you could see him, you know, break it to less than plus 500 i think Jaden daniels is going to keep turning heads you know first couple of weeks we say it's kind of weird it's like well not a lot of people are giving the same the same outlook on it not a lot of people have the same perception they they think that oh it's just an lsu fan talking noise they're comparing him to joe burrow again they're going crazy and then he does it over and over and over again and he puts up these numbers to where he's forcing his way into this conversation now when you have a, a offense that is one of two in anything, you're doing something right. Mike Denbrock is putting the pieces together. Brian Kelly's putting the pieces together. This team is very talented. And if the last two years of Brian Kelly's tenure at LSU, really the first two years, these last two seasons, if this is going to say anything about how this era in Baton Rouge is going to be, then Brian's for sure going to win a national championship and keep that trend of LSU coaches bringing home the gold. Year to year first. I think Brian Kelly's definitely putting LSU on the right track, whether it be in recruiting. I mean, even the transfer portal classes he's pulling in. And then the way that he can get guys to kind of avert all of the distractions mentally, whether it be a Florida State loss, an Ole Miss loss, different things throughout the season. You know, this is a team and a group that has time and time again shown that they're able to regroup, go out there, perform, and just ignore everything. So I think going forward... We might not have a clear path to a, you know, a college football playoff or an SEC championship. We might need a lot of big pillars to fall for any of that to even open back up. Not impossible, though. We'll continuously cover it. We'll be covering every LSU home game. We'll have a breakdown posted right after all the home games. Y'all let me know in the comments what you would rather. Would you rather it Saturday night a little bit later, or would you rather it Sunday morning, bright and early the very next day? Drop the comment. And make sure to subscribe. We got a lot more content coming. A lot, a lot more. A lot of different things. A lot of, whether it be live stream reactions, uh, press conference breakdowns, game highlights, you name it. We'll be on it. Thanks for watching. This has been the Vernon Verdict. Y'all have a good one.